the globe was something that we humans made starting with european imperialism starting with capitalism uh, with our technology we made it but the planet is something else we we depend on it for our life every day Hello, and welcome to the final and the eleventh episode of uh, Chicago uh, Dialogues, uh, a series that has been um, co-produced by the University of Chicago Center in Delhi and Prohor.in. And Mr. Abhik Chandra has been a wonderful curator and anchor for the series. Um, today's Episode is a slightly awkward one for me to introduce because it's actually about uh, my recent book, and um, and I have to say in all honesty that if Abhik hadn't really insisted on doing an episode on 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 this book and my work, we probably wouldn't have done it. So I have to thank Abhik for his enthusiasm about and and uh, and his interest in in in, in my work. Uh, but before uh, we go on to discuss the book, uh, I will let Obik mention the poetry festival that's uh, coming up, uh, and uh, which is actually a matter of collaboration again, uh, in which the Chicago Center is involved. Uh, so, Obik, uh, do you want to talk about the poetry festival a little bit before we get into the sure, matter sure. of the, uh, the discussion? Yes, yes. Divizda, thanks very much. Before we um, talk about anything else, I wanted to thank you, not just on my behalf, but on behalf of Prohor and on behalf of all the viewers who've been you know, listening very eagerly and watching the Chicago Dialogues ever since last September. Uh, thank you for being such a wonderful mentor and champion and supporter of the humble work that we're doing and, and we hope to you know, collaborate in, in projects again going forward. So viewers, many of you would have seen the, the three-part or three-episode poetry symposium that we conducted last month. And on a much larger scale, on a much more ambitious transnational scale, and hopefully in a digital, physical, and digital kind of a combination, we have plans of, we have grand plans of doing a four-day or a five-day festival that's dedicated to poetry. This is going to be in March 2022, assuming, you know, the best scenario and, and you know, the COVID pandemic goes behind us by then. And that is again uh, a major event or a major series of events where the University of Chicago Center in Delhi will be collaborating with us uh, in order to not just sponsor and produce many of the events, but equally important to have some of the most esteemed faculty members and poets come in, fly in from the University of Chicago and take part in discussions, dialogues, and poetry reading. So that's definitely something that we are all looking forward to. Apropos of today's event. Okay. Uh, okay. 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 May I interrupt you? Please. And before we uh, start talking about the book, may I also take this opportunity to thank you for being such a great host of this series. Thank the Proho team, uh, you know, uh, Amitesh and his colleagues. Uh, Akash, Shonok, and everybody else for the wonderful work that they've done. And also thank my colleagues at the University of Delhi Center, uh, who, who really have done sterling work to make this uh, series a success. In a year that has been difficult institutionally, personally, collectively for all of us. So, you know, so let's hope we'll have a better year next year going forward. Uh, uh, and now, I'm all yours for the discussion. <laughs> Thanks, Dipeshda. So, uh, interestingly, Dipeshda, and, and also to the viewers, 
today happens to be World Environment Day. And, and there's absolutely no better way of commemorating it than to highlight and to celebrate Dipesh Da's latest book, which is The Climate of History in a Planetary Age. Now, Dipesh Da is one of the greatest living intellectuals in the world today and a celebrity in the world of academia and a very favorite and well-known, well-loved face as far as pro audiences are concerned. But just purely by way of protocol, Dipesh Da, if you permit, just two or three lines of introduction. Um, Dipesh Chakraborty sure. is the Lawrence sure. Hamilton Distinguished Service Professor of History, South Asian Languages and Civilizations, and the College at the University of Chicago. He holds a graduate degree in physics, a master's degree in business administration from IIM, and a PhD in history. His areas of interest are equally eclectic, and they span from modern South Asian history and historiography to subaltern, indigenous, and minority histories, decolonization, environmental history, and by corollary, most recently, climate change. He is the recipient of numerous awards and accolades, one of the most notable being the Arnold J. Toynbee Prize, which he won in 2014, and which recognizes social scientists for their significant academic and public contributions to humanity. Uh, I've come to know that very recently, an extremely prestigious university in Europe has conferred upon the Pishda uh, an honorary doctorate degree. I'm not getting into the details because I think that's going to be formalized later in this all. Uh, the Pishda, your book, when we were talking about it earlier, right? And this, this, you said it chronicles your own experience. And even as a reader, I felt the same. Is that it takes one on a journey of of examination into the various factors and facets of climate change. Of course, there are profound implications for the world. And I was thinking maybe it would be good if we can start at least our discussion in the same spirit of that journey. Right? And to that extent, if you can have some markers on the topography in terms of the, the specific terms and terminology that's used. So two of the terms that are recurrent through the book and the most basic ones are the global and the planetary. What do we mean by these two terms? And if you can explain to the viewers with some examples. Um, thank you, Avit. Um, I think that, I mean, the book is, it is itself a journey uh, of uh, different points in my life where I was trying to make sense, human sense of climate change. But, um, but journey is a good description because See, normally when I've done uh, work in history, there have been models to follow, somebody else's work. Like when I first started with my PhD and I was working on labor history, there was the famous work of E.P. Thompson uh -huh. that, had, that was already globally influential, influencing all of us. And it was kind of a model, something to argue with, something to argue against, something to agree with. Similarly, when I wrote a book on Jadunath Sarkar, now, there were other models of people writing about intellectual biographies of some well-known intellectual or biographies of some well-known intellectual, or looking at a particular problem through the life of a, of a well-known intellectual. So there were models to follow. But when I, as a humanist historian, started to think about climate change, there were no models to follow. Uh, I mean, there was, nobody had written uh, uh, a book that I could actually argue with, and in a and in a sense, um, I had to, in a way, cut my own path. Uh, so I had to create my own markers, and many of these markers. So it was not looking back. I don't think it's uh, surprising that my first uh, article on what climate change and the science of climate change might mean for historical thinking or the practice of a historian took the form of certain questions, four or five questions, which I published in the form of theses. But, you know, I first wrote it up, these questions in Bangla for a journal called Baromash that, was, uh, that used to come out in Kolkata, from Kolkata, and was edited by... Uh, 
the late Ashok Shen, who was a teacher-like figure for me, who used to be a professor in the Center for Studies in Social Sciences. And Baromash is uh, the magazine he used to run until the very end of his life. And, and I'd been promise bound to give him an essay every year when Baromash became an annual, just one, one a year issue. And I remember I wrote it up first for Baromash. And I put my questions in the forms of thesis in Bangla using the word shutra and or, or threads. And interestingly, there wasn't much. Uh, it kind of it kind of fell on deaf ears. There wasn't much reception of the of the essay because you know they said my friends said yeah it's interesting but but these are not things you think about. And then I came back to America, and the editor of a journal called Critical Inquiry, of which I was then one of the editors came to me and said, the issue were short of articles. Do you have something you could give us? So I wrote it up in English, enlarged it, added more footnotes, you know, made it into a scholarly article. And suddenly, boom, it went everywhere. It got translated into many languages. It produced a debate. Uh, I was criticized a lot. I also received some praise. But that's how the journey started intellectually. And initially, the, the one of the one of the main questions I was asking was that if the climate scientists are saying that humanity has become a geological force, that that humans, their technologies, the animals they keep, uh, all these things kind of make up a complex. The impact of which on other forms of life and on the planet is. It's the same as the impact of an asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs or a huge volcanic eruption. And I kind of thought, oh dear, I've never thought about humans as a volcanic eruption. I never look at fellow humans and think, you know, collectively, we are like an asteroid <laughs> striking the planet with all the negative consequences for life that could follow from such a strike. And my question was, how do I deal with this other form of existence for humans uh, that we, I don't think about? You know, I, I, I mean, so if humans are like a volcanic eruption, normally in history writing, volcanic eruption is the background event against which you write human history, right? So the destruction of Pompeii or a volcanic, you know, an earthquake in Portugal, famous earthquake in Lisbon, 18th century, or the Bihar earthquake in 1934 when uh, Tagore and Gandhi, Rabindranath and Gandhi differed and had a public argument about how to understand that. But normally we treat these disasters as a backdrop to human action. But what if humanity itself is a disaster? Like a, like a disastrous event, which is not always, but our expansion, our uh, affluence, our consumption, our technologies. And also when I read the fact that we are now, we have changed the face of this planet, literally, from continental shelves to landscapes. We have changed everything. We moved more Earth around than all the rivers taken together. So it was astonishing to read all this and to think that's also what humans are. Apart from being Obhik and Deepesh and Onitesh and these individual humans, you know, who have their small lives, you have a job, you have aspirations, you fall in love, you fall out of love, you hate somebody, you love somebody. Those are also true. And I was kind of thinking, how do I put these scales together? And, and as I was working through, I was also making mistakes because I was reading up these new areas. So initially, I, in my first article, I made too much of a division between geology and biology. And I said, look, we have any human being is a biological agent. But maybe geological agent will become collective. But later on, I realized that the Earth is a very special part, kind of planet where the very fact of having life here changes the physical nature. So, for instance, we have so many oxygen breathing animals, including us, that we have a lot of oxygen in the air that actually oxidizes a lot of material, minerals. 
So the planet is mineral rich because there's life on this planet. A planet without life would not have so many minerals. So as I was reading all of these things, this connection between life, biology, and geology became very important. And that's what eventually resulted in making a distinction conceptually between what I call the globe and the planet that you were talking about. So what I realized is that the word globe in the expression globalization and the word globe in the expression global warming meant very two different things. Completely different things. And the globalization, right. So globalization is a story of humans, our technology, our empires, our colonization, our destructions of human societies and how we made this sphere into a habitable sphere where we are all connected by technology. Whereas the planet is what the climate scientists were describing as the Earth system, where life and, and uh, geology, they were saying biology and geology were connected. And that planet uh, The story of the of the Earth system is a story in which humans cannot be central. Because humans come so late in the story of evolution, in the history of the planet, that you can't be the we can't be the central characters of the story of the planet, right? Because if the planet, so imagine the planet being hundred when it dies. So imagine the planet is hundred when it actually dies, right? But there's no life on it. Humans turn up when the planet is about 80. So, so we turn up as a life form when the planet is quite old. So therefore, when we tell the story of the planet and of life on it, we can't be at its center. And you know, and the, the most. Uh, and the way I was saying Go the ahead. way we are going, we might actually be hastening its end. Well, we may or we may become, we may wisen up, we may do, correct, we may take corrective steps. That's a different question of policy, technology. I mean, there's both good and bad in what we do. So we, we harm ourselves, but we can also, yeah, we are a, humans are a learning species. We learn from mistakes. So we have made very serious mistakes. But it doesn't mean that we'll have to continue to make them. Right. Uh, Dipesta, talking about, you talked about time frame and time scale. So there is human time, which is the time of recorded history. So we talk about, you know, 500 years or, you know, the, the period of the colonial empire or the Mughal empire before that, and Delhi Sultan and so forth, going back to a few millennia, just a few millennia. But the planetary time, which is a much deeper time, which you call deep time, is a far, far, far more ancient time scale. And the way that I, I sensed from your book and also when you explained it to me when we were talking about it, is that for ages, up until very recently, the planetary time was moving literally at a glacial pace. But the historical time, the human time with all its wars and revolutions and upheavals was very fast. Except that now, the two are kind of clashing and planetary time itself is 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 rapidly sort of unraveling. Would you, would you want to comment on that? Sure. So what, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, you're right, but you know, a, a more clarifying way, a clearer way to approach the problem might be to say that we are always surrounded by deep time. We are produced by deep time, but we are forgetful of it. So that we take it for granted. So take this question that you have two eyes, I have two eyes. You have a nose, I have a nose. You have lungs. It's taken evolution a long time to actually create creatures with binocular vision, with the lung mechanism. You know, the fact that the coronavirus can work through us is because it's almost pre-adjusted, pre-modified uh, to work through creatures that have actually lungs. Because it irritates your lungs. So you cough or you sneeze, and that's how it propagates itself, right? So when you think of your body, your body is a product of deep time. It's taken millions of years to produce your body. 
even though your body your own body may not exist for millions of years i i bless you that it does but it may not so uh, so you know so in a way deep time is all around us we, the planet is all around us we kind of know it and forget it you know a student of like when i see you when i i encounter you i say i thought it's a lovely day isn't it mm-hmm. and what i'm actually talking about is the sun doing a particular work the wind blowing in a particular way right the temperature being of a particular kind of a particular level which is comfortable for me i'm actually talking about what the planet does but the planet is yeah. encapsulated in what i would call the phatic so the planet become part of phatic conversation when i ask you abhik how are you you say i'm well what you mean to say is that no virus no microbes have yet bothered you you haven't been infected by anything right so when you say i'm well it's like saying the planetary part is fine to <laughs> ask me about my human part is my wife doing all right is my child doing okay right so the planet is something that we always constantly acknowledge and forget but when the crisis the planet becomes an object of cognitive concern first of all you come to know about it cognitively and then more you think about it you also make affective connections with it you you can fear it and actually when you have disasters wildfires like amphan or cyclones like amphan or wildfires like in california and australia you mm-hmm. realize that when you are actually faced with planetary fury it reduces you to your creature the existence you know you're just trying to survive you you're no longer the author of darashuko mm-hmm. uh, if if there's an earthquake happening you want to build the building you know and the author of darashuko will want to get out as quickly as your domestic dog might want <laughs> and that's your creaturely life right so the planet has the capacity to reduce you to your creature in life to its fury and we are making the planet more and more angry more frequently angry that's the problem i mean i mean what you said uh, if you kind of reduce it to neurological terms a little bit of neuroscience it is that essentially what you're saying is when you're writing the book right or when i'm writing my i'm dabbling in history it's really the prefrontal cortex that's working more than anything else but when faced with a life death crisis that. that's where the amygdala takes over it's like a fight or fright or freeze which is the the oldest part of the right. brain right that's right. the reptilian brain goes Absolutely. back to the dinosaurs and that takes over everything else right. everything else goes out the window right so so in a, so what i'm saying is what you're calling deep history runs right through us we would not have been here as particular individuals without deep history creating us but deep mm-hmm. history is precisely what we always kind of acknowledge and immediately forget we we are reminded of it but we convert it back into human terms mm-hmm. right so so when we are having an epidemic or pandemic we don't think of it as an episode in the history of life which also it is we think of it as a political question did the why was the government not ready in time you know should we have another right. government so we convert mm-hmm. it back into human terms but sometimes the particularly with global warming the crisis is so deep so large so pervasive that it's not possible to convert it to, to reduce it only to him terms yes indeed uh, talking about the you know germs and microbes and the pandemic because i'm i'm sure you've been asked this question or variants of this question like 50 times over but maybe just one more time is it fair to say that one way of viewing the the covid pandemic and it's you know ravaging the the entire world is to see it as the planetary serving notice the non human the terrestrial serving notice to the global and its agent the, the agent of the global uh, a technological homodeus if you will yes well no i guess you know um um so as you know infectious disease specialists have a word for diseases that come to humans from wildlife so they call them zoonotic diseases so this is when a bacteria or a virus jumps species from wildlife and normally wildlife doesn't seek us out 
why creatures know to avoid humans from their own evolutionary experience. I mean, tiger, you wouldn't, a tiger wouldn't suddenly, suddenly turn up in Kolkata. You know, if it did, it would be a dead tiger in no time, right? But so while, when we are encountering wildlife, or when species can jump, it's because we force wildlife to come close to us. And that we do by destroying their habitat. And one of the main ways we destroy habitat of wild creatures is by destroying jungles, forests. And the destruction of forests is mainly to do with farmland and human habitations. You know, like Mumbai is expanding into the leopard territory. Delhi has a huge number of uh, monkeys who are now becoming urban. Learning to live in Delhi, right? So these have all come because they've lost habitat. And it's because human, the human domain is expanding, or the human world, the human samsara, as it were, is, is expanding. So it is, gives us a message that if we expand too much, then we, make, we force wildlife to come close to us. And we open up all kinds of ways for species to jump, for bacteria and viruses to jump species. And then because we are global, we are so many numbers, we are connected, we travel frequently, we live in crowded cities, suddenly the virus goes global, using us as the vector for mm -hmm. going global. Yeah. So it is, a, it is a kind of notice being sent to our, our kind of civilization. Basically, it's saying right. withdraw, don't expand so much. So much. Right. <laughs> Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about, and this is just purely some anecdotal maybe thing that I would point out, is not too long time back. I mean, if you look at global or the globalization, right, a lot of that has to do with modernization or, or technology playing a very important part of our lives in the worst case and beyond. So let's say the industrial revolution and so forth, right? But even as recent as let's say the mid 19th century, okay? I'm, I'm just going to use a, just purely anecdotally, say a year like 1844. And the reason why I just plucked this out of thin air is because I was just reading, one of the things that happened is that the great painter, the British painter Turner, exhibits his painting, Rain, Steam and Speed, the Great Western Railway. And that is where he uses his incredibly expression, his brush strokes and his, you know, literally a, an outpouring of his soul to celebrate the influx of technology. And in 1844, the same year, a few months later in October, William Wordsworth writes an open letter to the Morning Post where he argues that there should not be an extension of the railway lines, north, northwards, into the Lake District, specifically into Kendall and Windermere. So either way, one has a clear sense of man negotiating with technology. So his core is anchored to nature, to the planetary. He's either grudgingly negotiating, as in the case of Wordsworth, or with curious enthusiasm, as in the case of Turner. But it's, I belong to the planetary and I'm negotiating with the global, I'm negotiating with technology. What has happened in the last one and a half centuries to not just invert this relationship, but also go to the extent where, you know, the, the relationship between humans and nature is almost severed for many of us. Yeah, and before I go there, 1844 is also when Mark writes his economic and philosophical manuscripts. And also it's, uh, you're talking about time, I mean, Turner is also making painting out of industrial smog, you know, uh, a lot of, you know, so Turner's kind of, if you want to call it celebration, you might call it documentation. However, you want to think aestheticization, yeah, I've been yes. So up so up until the romantics, the romantics have a certain critique of technology. Mm -hmm. And there's still this idea that technology is something we create and we should be in charge of it. But many people argue now that we are no longer in charge of technology. Technology itself has taken charge of us. Yes. And you know, uh, this is specially put forward by a geologist, a Duke called Peter, 8 billion now. So think of our human population. 
six billion in 1900. Six billion in 2000, in one century, four times. Now eight, maybe going on to 10. And he says that's made possible by technology. Technology includes medicine, includes uh, public health and all of those things. And he said, he said, if you took away all the technology today, human number will crash uh, to 10 million. So, so his argument is that technology has become the precondition for biology. In other words, tech, in other words, if you want to sustain so many human beings, mm -hmm. you can't give away, you, you can't give up on technology. So the critical question is who is the master? Can we socially regulate technology? Or will technology take us? So is, is there a kind of whatever the answer to it, there's a clearly a path dependency now. Mm -hmm. In other words, human conveniences, human societies are based on technology. Increasingly so. So one can only say that going forward, technology is going to play an important role. So we are no longer in the Wordsworthian situation where, uh, or even the Rabindranath Tagore situation where you can say, you know, no, give me back the forests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What we can think about is a, is a social regulation of technology to some degree. What we can think about is how do we scale back? How do we, how do we make sure that we don't have to dis we don't destroy all the forests and imperil ourselves? Right? So, so the question is no longer about uh, just destroying technology or just giving up on technology. The question is how do you regulate technology? What role can technology play? But as a species, we are dependent on technology for our numbers, to sustain our numbers. Yes. That's Peter Hayes' argument. So maybe the world's work and moment is behind us. Talking about technology, uh, Dipesha, one of the things that, that becomes very important is much of the technological disruption or advancement that we see in the workplace, particularly, is of labor-saving nature. And the pandemic, right, and, and the forced social restrictions has actually hastened the pace of such labor saving kind of technological development, right? So at some point, is, is development and, and technological advancement becoming antithetical to each other, particularly in, in a society or in an economy like India, which has traditionally been and continues to be vastly labor surplus and labor intensive? Look, it's hard to know how it will go. When we are having our discussion with Raghuram Rajan, you remember, Raghu was talking about a situation where technology maybe do, maybe will do all the work that human labor used to do. And therefore, he was saying, can we create jobs that only humans can do, that machines can't do, like jobs that require empathy? Uh, or jobs that require empathy. I mean, maybe one day with AI, machines will be able to have empathy, but empathy. now they don't. Yes. Right. Uh, that, remember, that's what Raghu was saying. That yes. That's one way to go. But I think another proposition that economists have put forward is the whole question of universal basic income. Income. Mm -hmm. Yes. Against which people, would, people might do, you might get people to do creative work. So a variant of Raghu's proposition that, that technology mm -hmm. takes over human do humans do other things. But the problem is that there is no one solution. There may be a solution on paper. So Raghuram Rajan may say, this is the way to solve it. Or Prana Bardhan may say, this is the way to solve it. But the problem is that humans never agree on one single rational solution as a whole. So whatever the solution, so you, you always have to be ready for the fact that whatever looks like a good solution can be gamed by some people. Right? So there is no human way out of that predicament that whatever looks like a good solution can actually be gamed because you know human situation is never without power. And and therefore, um, <clears throat> 
some economists have called for social regulation of technology. I mean, all I'm saying is that going back to my book and, and, and the climate problem and the and the problem that we are facing is that technology now plays a dual role. Climate science as a science would not have been possible without technology. And sometimes it uses the same technology that's been destructive of the planet. So to give you an example, you can't make a claim that the Earth now has the highest concentration of CO2 in the air. Highest ever in the last 800,000 years. How do you make that claim? Because you basically extract ancient air bubbles from polar ice caps. You dig down. Where do you get the digging technology? It's the same digging technology that petrol petroleum companies use for digging oil up. You modify it for boring ice, right? So you can see that technology has this technology both informs us of the nature of the crisis today. But it is the same technology that has actually led to the crisis. Yes. Yes. And what I'm saying is that it's, ne it's never human. Sorry, Abhik. Uh, I was just reminded of, uh, in your book, you talk about there's also the cult of technology, you know, the cult of modernization as, as a power, um, as, as, as a vehicle of empowerment. And there's this recurrent, almost haunting image that you've created in your book of Jawaharlal Nehru, where he's gazing at the map of India and he's gazing at that large map and it comes alive to him as vast reservoirs, vast sources of energy that can be harnessed and ought to be harnessed, right? But, you know, less than eight decades down the line, we've come to the stage where we've had absolutely brazen, indiscriminate, rampant afforestation. And hills, I mean, from the stage where you use quarries in a meaningful, methodical, systematic manner to aid your public work, to aid the, 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 the building and construction of you know, dams and, and reservoirs and so forth, to the state where, and, and you've called this out in your book, where it's, it's literally chopping off, cutting off the hills, changing the landscape irrevocably, and thereby obviously, you know, uh, warping up the, the planetary system, the ecological balance that, that is there, raising the temperature, for instance. So in, that, in this kind of a milieu, right, you, you mentioned a few minutes ago, what would be some of the ways in which technology can be harnessed to heal, harnessed to create or to rebuild? So, Obi, I can talk about the basic things that are involved in this. Right? I mean, I, it's hard for me to give you uh, a solution that would be one size to solve the solution. But clearly, the message of the crisis are manifold. One of the messages is that we need to scale back our civilization, not make it as extensive on this planet as it is. So we need to ensure that we don't cut down forests. I read in a scientific journal that if we cut down 25% of the existing forest cover, it will be disastrous. We are at the moment at 17%. So we're not very far from the danger point. Mm -hmm. So we need to design other modes of human habitation. We need to think seriously about how to feed human beings without destroying forests, without extending the human domain, without forcing wildlife to come to us. Edward Wilson, the Harvard biologist, has one concrete uh, suggestion. For biodiversity, he says there are about 147 or 144 national parks, designated national parks. And in most of these national parks, humans have taken out the capstone species, which was sometimes a plant, sometimes an animal. And he's saying, let's at least restore these national parks to the kind of ecology they had before human intervention. Restore, restore the capstone species and see what the park gets back to. So increase biodiversity in, in, in that kind of way. So we have to realize that how important biodiversity is to our own well-being. And we have to realize how important forms of life that we consider inferior, like planktons, 
like fungi, like bacteria, mm -hmm. like algae, like virus, like plants are to the maintenance of complex multicellular life on the planet. We come much later. If life is like a mansion, we're on the top floor and these guys are keeping the mansion going. Okay? And because of urbanization and industrialization, the more we become an urban, this goes back to your question, the more we become an urban dwelling species, the more we lose that immediate sense of connection with the countryside. So we, we even don't have the kind of wisdom that peasant societies have. Forget indigenous societies, that even peasant societies have. Because we take it for granted that food will come, that water will come, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, so the principles are scale back, but provide protection to human beings. You know, one of the, one of the most important tasks of human politics for humans is to provide security of life and life and liberty, right? Life and liberty and property. And that principle doesn't go away. You can scale back and still provide that security. But you know, scaling back has another connotation. You should let your predators live. Humans have come to a position where only the viruses and the bacteria are, are real predators. All other predators are scared of you. So in the animal world, bluffing is very important. This bluffing is how different species live together. And humans have called out everybody's bluff. You know, we've called every other animal's bluff. I mean, we are scared of them only if we suddenly are confronted with an animal individually. But collectively, technologically, we have called their bluff. And the moment a species is incapable of bluffing you, it's dead, it's gone. You will destroy it. So a geologist, actually, whom I quote in the book, writes saying that we have forgotten any sense of reverence for other forms of life. And reverence means that you have to supplement your sense of wonderment about other forms of life with also feelings of respect and awe. And over 200 years, in praising fearlessness as the utmost virtue of human beings, we have actually destroyed some of the role that fear plays in allowing multiple species to live on the planet. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Dipita will turn a little bit, just for a brief while, to politics, because I think, sure. you know, uh, no discussion, no adda between any two Bengalis can ever be complete without some hint of politics. So maybe we talk a little bit about the politics of climate change. I mean, there's a, so everybody knows that between China and India, we have one of the, world, the two of the world's largest consumers of fossil fuel. But there's also an argument that it is because of the West and because of their indiscriminate you know, effluent uh, being spewed out all over the, the, the atmosphere over not just decades, but over centuries, that we have come to this stage. Therefore, to apply and to mandate the same stringent standards of ecological prudence on economies like India and China is actually a case of climate injustice, you know, because, you know, how can we be allowed to do that? And plus there are these other needs that we have. So for example, you know, there are temperatures, for example, which are rising in India all across. And therefore, something like an air cooler or an air conditioner, which may have been 30 or 50 years ago a tremendous luxury, is no longer so, particularly if you're, if you're living in a place like Delhi or many other places. How does one go about even answering this predicament? So the political question, which also is also raised, is an interesting complex question with many dimensions to it. And the justice question also has many dimensions to it. And the political question gets even more complicated when it becomes a justice question between humans and non-humans. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So there's questions of justice between humans, questions of justice between nations, rich nations and poor nations, rich humans and poor humans. And, and then there's the questions of justice or politics of power, domination between humans and non-humans. And then the question of short term versus long term. The air conditioner story is really a question of short term versus long term trade-offs that people will make. So first of all, let me make some bold and hopefully bold statements. The justice questions are all valid. 
12 nations all together china and india included do most of the emissions of greenhouse gas the bulk of other nations do very little but they're all impacted by what these nations do one fifth of humanity are the major emitters of greenhouse gases four fifths are not Yes. At the same, so justice questions are valid. The question is, how many of the justice questions can you practically work on while the crisis hasn't gone out of hand? So when they had the Paris deal in 2015, where countries agreed to make nationally determined contributions. to the reduction of greenhouse gases right so india decides its own targets nobody that deal was already made on the assumption that the crisis was degenerating so fast that you had to move away from the justice question to addressing the more pragmatic and immediate question what can one do the same thing applies to the air conditioner people using air conditioners so they i give the example of people buying air conditioners in delhi and increasing the poor 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 people who are the first time buyers so in a sense that you can easily predict being a marketing person or a business person that the air conditioner the market in india will boom and i know this from my own experience i have relatives who once had one air conditioner now have air conditioners in every bedroom you know once the older people the parents used to say no no you young people have air conditioners we don't need it now the parents need it yes. but you see the air conditioning argument is a trade off argument so the argument is for an aspiring indian family that i will live well today and acquire the skills that i need in 5 10 20 years time to be able to move away from delhi or kolkata when delhi or kolkata get in uninhabitable right so every air conditioner is contributing to the heat of the city So clearly, you're destroying the long-term future of the city, but you're buying time from the city, from the from the atmosphere of the city, so that you can get ten years in which to prepare your children or yourself to acquire the skills which make you more mobile, so that you don't have to die with the city. So these are trade-offs. You see, and nations are making trade-offs. I know of small Pacific islands which are investing heavily in education. so the entire nation can migrate as skill migrants you know i mean there was a uh, one pacific island leaders who came to australia while i was there once and said we don't want to be come as refugees as boat people to your shores and want you to hate us we want to come as skill migrants so give us educational aid so that when my island goes down <laughs> these seas have come up i will come to your country but as skill migrants people you need and that's a trade off right you you're putting money in education so that you can be more mobile so justice questions are completely valid but if the calendar for addressing them was an indefinite calendar one would say go for it but if the calendar is a finite calendar because there's a larger crisis coming so the us may not listen to india's demand for justice but suppose the crisis is so bad that the gas is is drying up or the ganges is over flooding i mean that question of the floods or drought is your immediate problem that you have to deal with so you know one has to deal with both the short term the long term the trade off so it's a very interesting complex question the justice question and i don't think honestly you can address all the justice questions all at once there are so many of them and they're so complex and the better this is something again that you pointed out in your book that the forces of globalization the global rather than the planetary would like to have each of these in terms of time scale right each of these planetary questions on an indefinite scale so they will treat it at par with you know the the kashmir issue or an israel palestine or the palestine issue. or the palestine issue or or issues around the balkans right uh and say okay this is something that we need to keep working on and keep looking at and and have an infinite kind of a time stretch except that the planet will not be able to bear it 
But the thing is, you know, um, that's another. I mean, I, what I present is a temporal question. It can also be discussed in terms of the institutional deficit we have now to deal with planetary problems. You know, to my the, the example I would love to give in our own context, in the South Asian context, are the Himalayan glaciers. So, you know, Bahuguna ji died recently, and I was watching a very interesting interview with someone I know a little bit, who used to be a professor at IAM Calcutta called Jayantu Bandupadhyay, an environmentalist who worked with Bahuguna ji. And he was saying that, you know, we often don't remember that the main product of the, these mountains, the Himalayas, are not apples <laughs> or orchards. The main product is water. The mountains produce so many rivers. And these eight or nine rivers coming out of the Himalayas serve countries from Pakistan to Vietnam. And a lot of these snow-fed rivers, the glacier-fed rivers, depend on the health of the glaciers. So normally, what would you think? You would think that there would be a multilateral agency, a governing body, between the countries affected uh, to manage the health of the glaciers. But the glaciers are treated as national property of the nation states, as are the rivers. Now, that's the kind of institutional deficit we have. If we're actually thinking planetarily, then we will be asking ourselves, what other institutions do we need which would actually work to make sure that the particular parts of the world that play a critical role in maintaining the climate of the planet are saved for humanity. We don't have those institutions. So the story about temporality, like global time, indefinite time, definite time, is actually a story about the the institutions we need to imagine in order to deal with the planetary problem. The institutions we have set up were meant for meant to solve what I call global problems. <laughs> See, I might just say, yeah, add one word. See, what adds what adds to the, the the crisis of temporality is the fact that the air doesn't listen to your arguments about nations. The fact that we have one air one atmosphere, and that had certain processes, physical, chemical processes happening. And those processes take a certain time, and that time is not dependent mm -hmm. on what Marx has said or Adam Smith has said. Right? So, so that's why we can't completely use human social time and human sense of social time, institutional time, to deal with the planet. Right. Yes. And, and that's why I often say it's a, it's a Marx plus problem. It, it's not a problem that Marx has nothing to say about, but mm -hmm. it's a Marx mm -hmm. plus problem. In the sense that, uh, again, this goes back to what you said at the beginning of the program, Ipilta, that, I mean, when you're talking about the previous work that you've done, you know, following the footsteps of E.B. Thompson, we talk, transpose that into the Indian or Bengal context, or to to contribute to the subaltern studies, where again there are markers, there's a platform, there are benchmarks that you can oppose, that you can vindicate, that you can validate, and then expand on. When you started writing, for instance, the four theses, there was hardly any literature at all in that particular genre or subgenre. Would it be fair to say that you know, moving on from things like post colonial or Marxist or subaltern in terms of views, in terms of prisons, it is perhaps the time has come, or maybe it's overdue to look at it in post-human, or you've also used uh, the word terrestrial in your interview with Kunalatu conversation, saying not non-human, but terrestrial, to expand it to beyond human. So it's just like Mars plus, like human plus. Is that the expansion of the prism that is required as of now, across disciplines, not just for yeah. historians, not yeah. just theology, but across? See, the prism has already expanded <laughs> in reality and in human practice. We don't know how to make how to make that expanded vision political. So to give you a simple example, let me go back to the pandemic. And when the pandemic happens and you're trying to create a vaccine, who do you try out the vaccine on? You try it out on animal bodies first, if you've got human bodies. 
so medical science has always uh, has told us for a long time that we share our bodies with bodies of other mammalian creatures or animal creatures as we were saying before so in a way there are all these intermediate bodies you know if 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 a, if a dotted line connection didn't exist between your mm -hmm. body and a rat's body you wouldn't be able to try out cancer drugs on rats first and then give them to humans so we have been aware of this connectivity for a long time but we still don't know how to actually make the dots make it political we know we know we know how to make it medical uh um, so we can describe it in terms of pathology mm -hmm. uh, we can describe it in terms of treatment but what we don't know is how to expand the sense of the political to embrace all this now latour donna haraway and there are people who are working on post humanism who try to do this imaginatively and i also think of them as the thomas mores of our period they're writing utopia because they often give you a blueprint of where we need to be but nobody knows how to get there how to get there yes there's no yeah and how to get there is the question and that's where we'll have to work creatively muddle our way through all kinds of uncertainty to get there so again so the need is to expand work on our expanding political imagination you know and beginning with what we can for instance a question i ask in one chapter that you may have seen is ask can we use the post world war 2 notion of refugees mm -hmm. for instance to understand the monkeys in delhi yes can we understand plants that are trying to move to weather zones where they can survive as refugees climate refugees can we expand the notion of climate with refugees don't humans i mean but you see as it is humans we don't even have a un definition of climate refugees for humans at the moment the number of refugees is 65 million the predictions are that if the climate if the average uh, rise in temperature is like 3 degrees we might have 300 million people and at the moment our governments are racist anti minority we produce phobia about immigrants mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with 65 million people looking for a home imagine what the world will be like when 300 million human beings are looking for homes forget the wild animals that comes but but if you want to work on this conceptually then you can you can start with some human categories and see if they work so as i said can we look on these monkeys as refugees and they're mm -hmm. refugees because we've destroyed their habitat right but i don't know that i mean as i said we're already having trouble defining humans as climate refugees so defining the monkeys as environmental refugees will be a while but and that is what exactly our confusion our confusion but that is something that you've pointed out in your book as well uh because that that in this particular case you you talk about monkeys and refugees there has to be a mechanism by which the global and the planetary can converse with each other instead of clashing with each other and i think one of the one of the solutions that you suggest from a biological intellectual standpoint is not to try and anthropomorphize everything in human terms but rather to take the human experience and see if it can be quote unquote provincialized right into the terrestrial into the non human into the post human so that's uh, yeah so one of the arguments i have so it's very interesting one of the, one of the arguments i have of it is that humans have not only come late to the world of life humans are a minority form of life the majority forms of life by weight and numbers are microbes not even creatures that we see creatures we do not see we cannot see except with our microscope some constitute the majority forms of life so when you think of humans as a minority form of life dominating the order of life it reminds me of apartheid south africa where a minority white population dominated the majority black population we thought, thought that was unfair 
and therefore i was asking how do humans develop minoritarian forms of thought and it's difficult because our governments are always encouraging majoritarian forms of thought right implicitly or explicitly there are available instances of minoritarian forms of thought you know in gandhi in certain phases in han arent in certain of her writings this about humans but can humans collectively both secure themselves have everything they need for their own security but also act like a minor form of life on the planet so that's the question i raise uh, somewhat uh, philosophically if you want to say but also trying to think how do we how do we learn from my, human minority minoritarian thinking to to ex- employ it on an enlarged and expanded scale yeah. can i tell you something okay. there is the complexity yeah. of it sorry no please please okay just going to make this point and then maybe you can take questions or comments or, or or you can have your own question but look at this look at the problem of this the only reason or the, the main reason we study bacteria and viruses is to control them right that's why most is mostly study them because they affect us if bacteria and viruses were humans you would call it a very colonial form of knowledge you know when humans when one human group wants to know another human group in order to control them mm-hmm. and dominate them we call it a colonial form of knowledge but if we but we do the same thing with viruses so the problem is we need to survive i mean these viruses can kill us maybe sometimes because of what we do but when you are faced with death you want to survive so i'm not an anti vaxxer <laughs> you know i'm in favor of the vaccination but what i'm saying is see how human centric or political categories are that we cannot think of the viruses as people because then we have to say that we have a colonial form of knowledge about them. so this form of knowledge is unethical knowledge with regard to humans but we don't think of it as unethical when when we apply it to viruses and i'm not saying we should i'm simply saying that i'm going back to your point that our political terms are so human centric that it's often difficult to apply them across the human non human value uh, uh dipesh that uh, i'm going to take up a few of the questions from the audience but before that one other question which i had and this really has to do with the the structure of the book and and the tone of the book what what really strikes me uh is as follows some of these are organically written at different points of time for example the the four theses was written at a much earlier period when he had a, a separate conversation with bruno to which comes in at the end but the way that it's arranged the way that the entire chapters in fact the narrative across the chapters it's arranged i got the sense that there's a a beautiful sort of geometric and at the same time almost musical structure to it so let me try and explain this so it's as if there is never any particular tone or any particular voice which is didactic it is always paired with a counterpoint with an emphasis so it's always a question of all right this is history and there's the history of capital there's our divided lives as as humans and our collective life as a dominant species this post colonial history this post human history it's almost like a like a you you use the term cross hatching which is a term of course that that's more than the fine arts but to me it it seems like perfect musical structure like you have antiphony you have a voice and then you have another voice right the early the middle age chorale which is answering that voice and and it's between these two voices that the that the narrative goes forth and the arguments go forth So was that something that you had in mind ever or did you see it as that well in the sense that you know I'm, i often say i'm not an either or person i'm an and person right <laughs> and i'm an and person because i think to grasp the complexity of the human situation you have to think on contradictory registers you know registers that 
may seem contradictory in first sight. So that a one-sided view of things may offer a solution. Like if you say it's all because of capitalism and let's destroy capitalism and everything will be fixed. And when they say that, you know, Michael Mann, a climate scientist, has a very good quip to it. And he says, you know, if you think that capitalism has to be solved first in order to solve the climate problem, then clearly the climate problem is not urgent enough for you. It can wait. Right? So the problem is you have to kind of tackle capitalism to the degree you can, but also while tackling the climate problem to the to the degree where you can. And and there's no so so I don't think the climate crisis is has one solution to it. It's in that sense not a solvable problem. It's a problem we have to negotiate, live through, uh, find multifarious local solutions, multifarious global solutions, miss out on some buses because of our own problems, uh, coordinating our action, right? Suffer for that reason. But it's also a time when you know some aspects of our individual lives take on planetary proportions. So in fact, this was pointed out to me by a Portuguese scholar who read the book, Maria Gago. And, and you know, because I have a discussion about population. And where I acknowledge that the only democratic way to reduce population is empowering women, educating women, empowering them, putting them, you know, giving them opportunities in public life. And as women are empowered and wealth develops. Population comes down, right? We know this from Kerala. We know this from other other areas. And if pop to the degree that population is something we want to think about in the planetary context, Maria was saying to me that Dipesh, what you really show is that women's reproductive capacity has become a planetary force. In other words, it can affect the future of the planet, mm -hmm. right? And suddenly, once you understand the population is a planetary problem, you suddenly understand that empowering women, which is a normal global solution to things, can now That's also have implications. planetary. Exactly. Yes. And therefore, even an individual woman's reproductive capacity becomes a planetary aspect of your life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Exactly. But the, 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 the reason you find the polyphony is because I don't think there's a, a kind of I don't think of a monotonic exercise could have addressed the complex dimensions of the problem. Mm -hmm. um, Dipesha, we've been magically able to answer quite a few of the questions that came up organically because we've woven them into the discussion. No, but before we, conclude, before we conclude, I wanted to take up at least two important questions. And the first one, which was there on the screen yeah. just a minute back from uh, Professor Nanda, if you can have that back again. Yeah. On screen, please. Yeah. Professor Nanda, thank you, Professor Nanda, for being there. Professor Nanda has been a good friend uh, and uh, a, a colleague. In, in this effort to think about you know, climate change. So his question is, uh, planetary aspirations, it's referring to this chapter, which is under the discussion of codes of math. Yeah, so, so, so you know, it, it seemed to me that, that in the Dalit question, in this problem of the Brahminical creation of a problem of untouchability, has also been a very perverse and cruel way of recognizing that our bodies are connected to the microbial world through waste matter, fecal matter, uh, dead animals. Mm -hmm. right? So I kind of think, so that's why I was thinking that, you know, that Rahid Bemula's suicide note reminded me, on the one hand, of his cosmological view, which is entirely true, that our bodies are also made up literally of the dust of ancient stars that are dead and very ancient particles go through our bodies and we are made up mm -hmm. of stardust and he's totally yes. right of the cosmological vision and he's he's also right asking for recognition as a human being but in in but his suicide note and the tragic death of this talented young man uh, reminded me as i was or made it clear to me as I was thinking through his the, his suicide and the note he left, that, that 
we Hindus have uh, a perverse and cruel way of recognizing the planetary aspect of our life in the phenomenon of untouchability, while otherwise in the fatty, we also have harmless ways of recognizing and then forgetting the planet, as in asking, mm -hmm. as in saying it's a beautiful day, or uh, as a Tamil friend, a former student, pointed out every letter from his mother began by saying, I am physically well, I hope you are too. Right? Yes. So he said, after that, all family stories began. But the first line was like both acknowledging the world that infects us and forgetting it. And it made me realize that the body, the human body is the site where we both mm -hmm. acknowledge and forget the planetary. So our individual bodies are the site where, where we can both acknowledge and immediately forget the planetary. As you think through the climate crisis, the forgetting is becoming difficult. You know, that's what I'm saying. But thank you for your question. Thanks for that, Dipista. Uh, we also take up Devopom Gongopalthaya's question. Devopom's question on screen, please. And so while we're waiting, I'll just I'll just read out from it. We're saying, how do we acknowledge, you know, the conditions? Of, of climate change. No, that's not the question. Okay, I'll read it out. So say, in situating human beings as a geological agent, how is our conceptualization of individuals or persons going to change in the coming future? Oh, so you've got a different question. On this yes, yes. So you're saying, you know, how is our conceptualization of, a, of an individual, of a human being, going to change in the future? Well, <laughs> Again, I have to go back to say that forget the future. Even today, we deal, we actually live with different conceptions of the individual, including our body. So, you know, so think the way a court of law with, will deal with you if you've, if you've been involved in a car accident. And under, and let's say allegedly under the influence, driving under the influence, then the court of law will deal with you as a responsible person, culpable because you self-consciously made a choice about drinking too much or whatever. So the, so the court of law will have a Lockean view of you, that you are, you are, capa you are capable of autonomous action, uh, you are capable of autonomous decision, and you can project your decisions into the world to have an impact on the world. But suppose the same person who has caused a car accident also has an ulcer in his stomach. And he comes to the hospital. The doctor will not take a Lockean view of him. The doctor will think that he is a human being with a microbiome. And there are bacteria that are causing ulcers. And he will actually treat, give medicines to treat the microbiome. And he will not think about you know, whether you are actually, this body belongs to a personhood of Lockean variety. So actually, if you look at complex societies, we have already, we operate with different notions of the human being in different sectors. But, but the climate crisis is one which brings all of these different visions together. Mm -hmm. and, and, yeah. and, and that's the challenge of, of the crisis. I think this is the question that we've been dealing with, right? Yes, yes. So the, the one that is one. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Okay. So, Dipista, we've, we've gone uh, way beyond time, but it was so engrossing and we continue to have questions from the viewers. So now uh, maybe we can have some concluding sort of observations or, or remarks from you, Dipista, before we close up. Um, well, let me say, let me um, put forward one of the main points in my book. Uh, so that when people go and read the book, uh, I hope this is something that will also stand out for them. So with the globe and the planet distinction, I argue that we have a sense of mutuality with the Earth normally. Uh, we kind of think that the Earth is made for us. So as Heidegger says, if we, when we approach a fruit-bearing tree, it is as if the earth, by rising as the sap of the tree from the ground, greets us in the shape of a fruit. And 
And I argue and I try to show in the last chapter of the book that the planetary crisis, which reveals the planetary is capacity for fury, which reduces us to our creaturely lives, that destroys the sense of mutuality. So our sense of mutuality is grounded in the assumption of the givenness of the world for us. Mm -hmm. Whereas the climate crisis, so the world as a background is given, and the climate crisis is telling us we have ourselves also become part of the background. Like becoming an asteroid like, a volcano, volcano like mm -hmm. entity. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, the givenness of the world is lost for us. And I describe that as the loss of this sense of mutuality. So we have to, going forward, we have to inhabit the planet, knowing that we do not live with it only in that relationship of mutuality that we had so far practiced by taking the world for granted. And, and what you alluded to earlier, right? Okay. Going back to the sense of respect, if not, if not awe, if not reverence. Right. 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 This has been Maybe that's a good point. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, no, you were saying something. I was saying, Dipesa, this has been absolutely wonderful talking to you. I mean, I had many more questions and hopefully some of that, uh, you know, will, will, will come out in print when we do our interview together. And, and I'm sure the viewers today yeah. also had uh, a great experience listening to you and gaining insight from you on something that is, and, and we discussed this, right? You With this book, you again broken your own mold. So you began by doing things which were very novel and very unique. And now, with this book, you've again broken your new mold. So I think even viewers or readers, just myself, who have read your previous books, had so much more you know, new things, novel things, and innovative things to learn from this work of yours. And I'm sure that uh, the, so the book, before I forget, the book has been released a week back. So it should be available in an increasing number of stores. And in terms of online, you know, the the, the basic uh, online platforms where you can buy the book. So keep a lookout, keep an eye even, out for it, and hopefully the Indian edition will sorry. also be available online. Yeah. You mean the Indian edition is coming? The Indian edition, yes. Primus. Primus is back. Primus. Yeah. Well, thank you, Abhik, very much. Thank you, all, everybody, for the year that we've had online doing this Chicago Dialogues program. And like, once again, I thank you. I thank Anitesh and his team, the Prohor people. I thank the Chicago Center, Delhi, my colleagues there. And uh, it's it's been very enriching and it's been a fun thing to do through this otherwise disturbing, distressing and tragic yes. uh, year for, for humans, at least. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for me personally and for the program team and you know all of our colleagues um, and friends at the University of Chicago, I think this was one of the things, this series, that has been able to bring us together, even though we're physically separated, and really bond us and really sustain us through these extremely trying times. So thank you very much again, Dipeshda, for being our, our mentor, a champion for getting this done. And hopefully we'll be in a position to do you know more of these. Uh, so until then, a very warm thank you again. Thank, thank you to our audience. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.